Hello, everyone. Welcome to Preemie Chats, and thank you for joining us today. I am Leah Whitehead. I am a preemie parent and a volunteer with Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. Canadian Premature Babies Foundation is also well known as CPBF, and its mission is to support and educate Canadian families of premature babies. This Preemie Chat series is one of the many ways that CPBF shares information with NICU families and healthcare professionals. Here every Friday, we talk with medical professionals, researchers, and parents who share with us their NICU experience and knowledge. And we want you to be part of the discussion too. So please let us know that you're here, leave a comment or a question in the chat section. And we also would like you to check out CPBF's website. It is canadianpremies.org. And there you will find all kinds of resources and support. Parents are the most important people and intervention a baby can have while they're in NICU. But we know that NICU itself can be very disorienting. So we hope that this website, you will find resources like our new video series, Welcome to NICU, that'll make you feel a bit more comfortable in that unknown environment. We have a very interesting topic today. We are talking about follow-up. Now, children born preterm are more likely to have challenges during their development. And this is one of those things that weighs heavily on a family's mind when they're in NICU. And it's also on the forefront of healthcare providers' plans, even at the beginning of a baby's NICU stay. For those very preterm, there is often a follow-up clinic that will follow babies well into their toddler years. Now, the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network, and that's also known as CNFUN, collects and reports on the health of children born premature when they are 18 to 24 months old. And this allows for healthcare providers and parents to be able to plan for their baby's needs. CNFUN has used medical definitions to classify disability based on how the child thinks, hears, sees, and uses their muscles. Parents have never been asked how they classify disability. Well, today we're going to hear about a study where parents were asked with the goal of discovering, do parents of preterm children and healthcare providers agree on how to classify disability? Over a thousand parents from neonatal follow-up clinics all over the country participated in this study and the findings are very interesting. There's only a fair agreement between parents' perceptions of their own child's development and current medical classifications. Parents generally classify their children as doing better than the medical perspective. And this is important for many reasons. Disagreement between parents and healthcare providers over the definition of severe health conditions may have life altering consequences. Understanding what outcomes are important to parents and co creating definitions will improve the care of very preterm infants and their families, as well as guide future research. I think we're gonna have a lot of discussion today. So after our presentation, we're gonna have a Q&A time with neonatologist, Dr. Ann Sines and Lindsay Richter. Lindsay is going to do the presentation and she is the national coordinator of the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network. She's passionate about implementation of research evidence and patient partnerships to improve the care of premature babies and their families. And I'm sure that will shine through today as Lindsay shares with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. And I'm looking, I'm looking forward to this chat today. I'll let you get right to it. You have a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> Sounds good. So we start um, with a really big question. So the question of our project is, do parents of preterm children and healthcare providers agree on how to classify disability? And I'm sharing this um, research on behalf of our larger research team, and I'm excited to share some of our results today. 
So to kind of paint the picture, um, when a child, uh, when a baby is born preterm, um, parents have many questions, they have ma many concerns, and they want to know what the lives of children born preterm um, and what the future may look like for their child. So doctors and researchers um, do their best to answer these questions. And one of the key resources we use to answer these types of questions about what the future may look like um, for their child is using outcomes of prematurity um, that come from data um, from clinical follow-up. So as mentioned, um, I'll go more into detail about what clinical follow-up kind of looks like. Um, and then we use this in addition to population-based studies um, to kind of predict in a way and to better understand um, what the future may look like for different children that are born preterm. So outcomes of prematurity, I kind of threw that word out there. Um, what does that really mean? So outcomes of prematurity really guide important conversations um, and discussions with parents um, in ways that actually are used to make critical health decisions. Um, however, preterm health um, outcome studies and clinical follow-up have traditionally focused mainly on um, definitions that were created by doctors um, without input on what parents are thinking are meaningful and important. So they haven't really been engaged in this earlier part of the discussion of what these outcomes should be. So we kind of want to ask as part of our larger research project, um, do parents really know and understand what the doctors are telling them in terms of are we measuring the right outcomes? So just to jump back a little bit, um, as mentioned, um, I'm the coordinator of the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network, or CN Fun, um, and all children that are born very preterm um, in Canada are seen at these clinics um, across Canada, um, and they undergo a standardized health assessment at 18 to 21 months of corrected age um, after discharge from the NICU. And as a network, CN Fund uses this information to report um, on the health and development of these preemies. And this information is very important for healthcare providers um, as well as parents um, in order to best plan for the needs of these, um, these babies. So in order to create these definitions, um, in, in order to create these classifications, we've used medical definitions to describe as well as classify health outcomes. So health outcomes um, that we kind of look at during the standardized assessments at neonatal follow-up clinics, including include um, the child's hearing um, and vision, um, their cerebral palsy status, um, and then development using this tool um, called the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development that looks at kind of three areas. The first one being motor and movement, so how um, uh, a child uses their muscles. Um, the second area being cognitive, um, so how a child mm. thinks and kind of problem solves. Um, and then the last one being language and language development. So once an assessment is done, done, CN Fund has used um, each of these categories to classify health outcomes. And traditionally, we've been classifying them as having um, no neurodevelopmental impairment. So neurodevelopmental impairment in terms of how the brain has been developing in these children um, that were born preterm. Um, and they can either be classified as having none of these, or if they have one or more of the um, the outcomes that are listed here of severe, if they have one or more of the following, um, they would be considered as having a severe health outcomes. So this would include CP where the child is um, not walking, um, a certain cutoff score in that assessment that I mentioned before, the Bailey, so that being less than 70 on the score. Um, if the child has a hearing or implant, um, hearing aid or implant, um, as well as if their vision may be um, impaired in both eyes. Alternatively, they may be considered in a category that we've defined as mild slash moderate um, if they have CP but are able to walk. Um, alternatively, if they have a motor score, a cognitive score, a language score in the Bailey in the 70 to 84 range, um, if they have temporary hearing loss or if the vision is affected in only one of their, in one eye. But when you really look at these kind of classifications that we've been using to kind of classify children and when they come into the follow-up visits, um, there could be some problems with the current way um, these outcomes are measured. So first of all, we've 
classified them into categories of severe or mild moderate. But would parents classify their child differently if um, they were asked these questions? Um, so we did not really, we didn't know that before the study. Um, and the second kind of problem that can come up with this way that we're currently measuring outcomes is that doctors and researchers created these uh, definitions on how to classify disability, um, again, on how a child sees, hears, and uses their muscles. But do parents agree on this um, classification system? And in the literature, even though we've defined it a certain way, there's still no consensus on how to measure, define, and report outcomes when it comes to neonatal follow-up. And in fact, as I mentioned, a key player in a child's life is their parents, and they've never been asked which outcomes they perceive to be most important. So that kind of brings me to the Parent Epic study, which is a large study that's been going on for several years, and I'm happy to kind of share one piece of that study um, in the first aim of the study, where the first aim is to define outcomes that are meaningful to parents. So really getting the parent voice in these outcomes. So today I'll be sharing um, a little bit of the first step of this larger project. Um, I previously had shared um, a, the second piece of it um, in a previous Premi chat. So it's great that I can um, be able to share another aspect of the study um, and be able to discuss it um, today. So as I mentioned, the Parent Epic Project um, is a, this is just one piece of the Parent Epic Project of a larger piece of the puzzle here. Um, and the project um, has several collaborators across Canada with all having the goal to engage parents to co-create definitions of neurodevelopmental impairment or how we define uh, disability and health outcomes uh, for preemies. So I'll kind of dive into the objective of the study that I'm discussing today um, and kind of what we were looking at and how we looked at it. So the objective, the overarching objective um, was defined as investigating the agreement between parents classification of their very preterm child's overall health status or neurodevelopmental impairment status at this 18 to 21 months corrected age visit um, and how that compared to the current CN fund classification of their own child. So again, research question was, do parents of very preterm children and healthcare providers agree on how to classify disability? So in order to do this, um, we had a study population. So we had all parents of very preterm infants that were seen at this visit at 18, 18 months corrected age, um, and they were all eligible to participate. And prior to going through um, the regular visit with their um, doctor, they were asked one question um, if they consented to the study, and that was this question that's in purple here. Please tell us how you would rate your child's development. So they can say that their child is developing normally in their perspective. Um, they think their child has a mild developmental impairment, has a mo moderate developmental impairment, or the child has a severe developmental impairment. And we use this language. Um, this is exactly taken from um, the, qu the question. Um, and then what we did here was looked at how the visit went and how the doctors classified these children um, and then paired it up. So I'll go into, I'll go into more detail about that in just a moment. So um, just for clarity, we did combine the mild and moderate together into one definition. Um, and I'll explain that in just a second. Um, but first, who participated in the study. So we had over a thousand participants, again, across Canada. So um, some of you may have participated in this study. So thank you for, for your time and um, contribution. And just to kind of summarize some of the study characteristics. So the parents um, filled out this questionnaire, but we were looking into the child's demographic information. So most of the children that um, were considered in the study um, had a gestational age of 26.1 weeks at birth, a birth weight of just under 1,000 grams, and a corrected age at visit of about 19.5 months. Um, and then according to that classification scheme um, used by CN Fun, uh, about 25% had um, any one disability, 54% uh, had uh, no disability. Um, and then um, in terms of the parents um, that were actually filling out uh, this questionnaire, 5% um, of these parents were a single caregiver, 
Um, and then 91.4%, uh, so the majority um, of the parents did have post-secondary uh, education. So what we did next is we used this um, scale um, in which the Cohen's, the Cohen's Kappa. So basically from the red to the green, um, it goes up in increments of 0.2 here. And um, if one, a score of one was perfect agreement, so 100% agreement, um, and zero would be agreement equivalent to chance, so just a random kind of um, estimation. We found that the agreement, um, oh, sorry, um, one more <laughs> bit of detail here is that it varied between slight, uh, fair, moderate, substantial, or near perfect. So again, with a 1.0 being perfect agreement, 100% in line, um, we found that the agreement between a parent's classification of their own child and then how their doctors classified them during this 18-month visit, um, the agreement was fair. So that's very, as you can see, this is um, quite far to the left side of the, the scale here and far away from perfect agreement of a 1.0. So the Cohen's capital was 0.29 and this was um, significant um, statistically for our researchers. So this is something we wanted to look more into. So what we did um, is we wanted to look at each of the classifications. So again, um, a thousand participants. So in 54% of the cases, um, the CN Fund had classified um, the children as having um, no disability, uh, according to the classification system. 29% um, had a mild or moderate um, disability, and then 17% had a severe disability. But when we look at how parents um, were classifying their own child, so that's going to be the the numbers that are showing up on the far right, 68% um, of parents classified their child um, as none, uh, has no disability, 30% um, having a mild moderate, and 2% having severe. So as you can see here, the parents are classifying their child as having less, um, less severe or no disability um, when you compare it to how CN Fun has been classifying these children. So the green boxes here are the number of parents that classified um, their classification actually matched with how CN Fun was classifying the same the same child, but these orange um, these orange bars here are showing that um, three hundred and forty nine. So that's thirty two percent of those classifications were actually more severe according to the CN Fund definition. Um, this means the agreement was only about 58%. Um, and then lastly, I'll just show you here the purple. Um, the purple is showing where the parents actually consider their child as having a more severe health condition um, than what CN Fund had classified. So much smaller amount, only 10% um, would consider their child this way. So we wanted to kind of look at what is the difference between the CN Fun classification of this mild, moderate health condition or disability. Um, so, looking at the the green the green section here, as well as the orange. The orange is where the parents classify their child as having um, no no disability. Um, what were the difference between these two two groups? So, taking where the agreement is in green, um, and then comparing that to where the disagreement is um, in yellow. Uh, sorry, <laughs> in orange, um, we saw that. Um, it's the only area of this um, of the neurodevelopmental impairment domains that were kind of different between these two groups um, was their scores on the Bailey, um, the standardized test um, for language as well as motor. So language and then how the child uses their their muscles. Um, we then wanted to look at the differences between severe classification. So now looking over at um, this table here. The green is where there was agreement. So 22 parents um, had a classification of their child have severe um, developmental challenges um, and CN Fun also agreed with that. But then there was 160 parents where they rated their child as having um, a less severe health condition, um, but CN Fun had classified them as severe. So what were the differences between these two groups? Again, we're seeing um, it was scores of the Bailey that were different. So um, they were scoring um, lower or higher on the Bailey if there was agreement, disagreement here. Um, and then also um, the numbers were quite small for visual impairment. Um, so that's not too much of interest. Um, but at the bottom, we have the physician rating of severe global developmental delay. And we did see that um, there were slightly 
if, if the, the child was um, considered having a severe global developmental um, delay, the majority of parents did agree with the classification system. And then lastly, just briefly, I'll touch upon if there is a difference in CN Fund classifying their child as having um, no disability, and then the parents um, classification system. So looking at the purple, where the parents are actually considering their child having more severe, which again, was only about 10 10% of this population. Um, what were the differences here? Um, the Bailey score was coming up um, as um, a different discrepancy. Um, but then also we wanted to look at maybe there's other factors that parents are considering when they're defining um, how their child would be classified. So we wanted to look at rehospitalizations, um, which isn't currently included in our um, current definition, um, and then the use of aids at home. And we found that the use of aids at home um, did were higher among um, those that agreed with the no classification. Um, uh, last we just, this is a lot of data here, but um, overall we did see that it did, there was disagreement um, based on the number of impairments um, that the child did have in terms of those um, orange bars here. And then lastly, looking at the parents um, demographic or the caregiver demographic, sorry, um, if the, parent had a post-secondary education or was a Caucasian ethnicity, um, they were more likely to agree with the definitions of CN fun and neurodevelopmental impairment or health conditions and disability um, versus those um, in the other categories, um, but it didn't vary by um, caregiver, single caregiver status. Um, so that was a lot of data. So I'm going to kind of just quickly kind of summarize our main key points um, and what um, what's the most important kind of takeaways from this study. Um, the first one being that the results are only showing a fair agreement. So um, they do not agree um, between parents and healthcare providers on how to classify disability and development. Um, and in fact, um, with this disagreement, um, point number two is that the parents are more likely to describe their child's development as normal or less impaired than how we've defined um, it in C and Fun. Lastly, um, when we're comparing the differences between the groups that agreed and disagreed, um, there was significant disagreements between categorization that was found for that Bailey, the Bailey scores, whether it be about how the child thinks, um, their language, or their motor development. Um, and number of impairments. However, um, this was not true for cerebral palsy status. So if the child um, had been diagnosed with cerebral palsy, um, it was more likely that the parent would agree with how the child was categorized by CN Fun. And then lastly, looking at the caregiver demographics, uh, discrepancies varied by parent education and ethnicity, um, but not by single parent uh, status. Um, so what does this kind of mean in the larger scale? Like, how can we apply these results into what we're doing um, across Canada with our neonatal follow-up networks? Um, and we've had uh, discussions with experts um, in neonatal follow-up and neonatology. And kind of some key takeaways that we found from these discussion is, and, and the results is that one, we need to revise the current CN fund classification system. Because as you can see here, it's not really aligning with how parents um, consider the development and disability of, of their child. Um, secondly, we need to increase the current threshold for what's classified as a disability um, as it re relates to neurodevelopmental impairment. So we focus a lot about on um, brain development um, in this study, but we acknowledge that potentially there's other factors that parents are using to classify how their child um, um, is seen in their in their eyes. Um, so that's something else that we need to consider. And then um, kind of stemming from that is when we think about the definition of child neurodevelopmental impairment, we need to consider other components and other measures that may contribute um, to how we're measuring these outcomes um, in the future for both the applications to clinical care, but also in how we measure, um, measure and report in research. So kind of some key take home messages from this um, and our, founding, our findings is that parents of preterm children and healthcare providers do not agree on how to classify um, disability and or um, and development. Um, and then secondly, kind of 
the larger message of the whole parent ethics study and the work that we're really, really um, focused on um, as a research group is that parents' voices are important to be included in research and uh, clinical outcomes of prematurity. So I'll kind of stop um, sharing uh, my slides now. And I just want to, again, want to thank the CN Fund parents and CPBF and all of um, everyone who's contributed to this study um, to get it to the point where it is right now. So happy to answer any questions and that'd be great. And I'm muted. <laughs> no, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I'm going to add Anne into the discussion now as well. Um, as I mentioned before, Anne is a neonatologist and a clinical professor who retired most recently from BC Women's Hospital and is now a researcher uh, at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. So you both work together on this project. So my first question for you is why is there a difference? Why do you think there was such a big difference between um, how parents saw their children and how uh, kids were originally scored? Um, that's interesting. Um, maybe I can jump in and then Anne can add. Um, so again, in this question, um, in this, for this question, it was done um, at the 18 month visit. So the child um, of the of the, that's um, being evaluated here is at 18 months old. Um, as clinicians, um, I think the majority of researchers and when we're using these um, outcomes for prematurity, um, we're looking kind of beyond 18 months and kind of into the future and their development and seeing what is, is most important here. And that's kind of a limitation on what we can predict and what parents are viewing at that, that stage of their child's development. Concerns that 18 months may be quite different um, than when the child's like three or four or five or entering or entering a school age. Um, so you may not consider something to be like a challenge at 18 months where it would be later on. And um, kind of that discrepancy may influence how parents are thinking at that stage versus um, how the healthcare providers are providing this information. Fabiana stole the question right out of my mouth. <laughs> she said, great work, Lindsay. Did you talk to parents of older children to see if the difference was still there? Yeah, well, not in with not with this particular question. So that's that's an interesting um, kind of viewpoint. So as I mentioned, perspectives kind of change as a child um, grows up and develops, and um, parents may have a different view on what's what is challenging and what's not um, so much. So we didn't do that with this particular question, but. Another piece of the puzzle with um, the other steps in the study is we did ask a different question um, that I um, would love to talk about maybe another time. Um, but we did ask parents a different question about more about the severity um, of their child's um, or what they consider to be severe and not severe. Um, and we asked that to, to children um, that were about three and four and a half years old. So throughout the study, we've engaged different groups of children at different ages, um, but not with this particular question. And that would be really interesting. This is just clarification for myself, but when we're talking about the different ages, is it um, that the healthcare providers are anticipating what will develop as they grow older and the parents are more in the moment with their children? And you want to take that one? Yeah, that's that's an unknown. And in medicine, we want to be very accurate in terms of what we say. And um, as Lindsay has pointed out, um, at 18 months, obviously children are still young. Um, we don't have a crystal ball as to what they will look like. And even though the Bailey um, assessment that we use is considered one of the best ones for that age, it's still not perfect at predicting the future. So therefore, we've been very careful at um, not saying that if you do poorly on the, um, on the Bailey, that that means there's going to be, um, you know, a major problem down the road. And going back to your original question, um, one of the things that I've often found talking to 
um, my colleagues who don't see children in follow up or other people is they want to know, well, is my child going to be normal? And I think back to when I was in school and I'll ask the audience to do the same thing. And if you had been asked who in the class is normal and who is abnormal, I bet that you would say, oh, I don't know how to do that. What does normal mean? And the other thing is if you think back to your class or another group of, of people, you'll say, well, that person, yeah, they're not very good at soccer, but boy, they're a whiz at music or math and somebody else is good at other things. And so it's very difficult to put people into boxes that are called normal or abnormal. Absolutely. Unfortunately, um, when we do research um, or what we, the type of research where we use numbers, you often need to put them in boxes to do the math and the statistics and to be able to say, does this treatment work or does that treatment not work? Um, and it was that scientific need to put kids in boxes that that then led the early researchers and everybody just kind of followed in the same footsteps to say well you know what we'll decide that for example um any child who does worse than 97 percent of other people or 16 you know in the bottom 15% or 16%, they pick some um, number and say that if you do worse than that, then we're going to call it a severe disability. So that was the mindset of the researchers, which has then been carried on, but it never reflected on um, whether that the impact that that has on a child, on their family. And uh, as a individual, um, and when I don't look at it through a medical license, you know, I don't rate based on where, if you're the bottom 3% or 10% or whatever, I look at the things that you can do. Right. And it's taken a long time for us to get here. And I want to thank... Um, you know, as the founding director of, of CN Fun, um, when I first wanted to look at the results, I thought that the people, the experts knew what, you know, were the experts and they knew what they were doing. And I want to thank the parents who then said, well, we don't actually disagree. We don't agree with you what you're calling severe. And that was actually the impetus to the start of all these projects to say, let's rethink how we call things, what, how we describe children who were born preterm and make sure that um, when we're talking to parents and other important people in a child's life, that they actually know what they mean. Um, and, you know, I'm sure for most of you to say, how a child scores on their Bailey is not how you think of them. Um, and so the voices that um, so many parents and other um, stakeholders have done is really helping change this whole way we describe and report on and, and, and think about prematurity. Um, so thanks to all the parents and people who have um, participated. Sorry, that got a bit long. <laughs> no, I think it's amazing that it it came about because parents were were questioning and asking. I I think there are terms that sometimes are used in the medical community that don't apply as as we've discovered. What was the team surprised by these results, or did you kind of know it was coming before you talked to those thousand parents? 
Um, I wasn't surprised. Um, and a lot of it came from my clinical experience. Even some of my colleagues who would read a research report where it said, oh, if you have this condition, you're going to have a severe disability. And they go and they talk to the parent and the parent had heard that my child won't be able to see or hear or walk or talk. And I would then go and talk to them and say, no, here are, um, I mean, I never use names or anything, but here's sort of examples of some of the things that these kids can do and the fact that they can be happy and they can participate and they can, part, um, you know, they may, there may be some things that are challenging, but there are many things they can do. Um, and one of the other parts of this study we've really heard from parents is um, we've tended to report on the things that um, children born preterm can't do, but we're not very good at saying about all the things that they can do. And providing that balanced picture and making it a broader picture is, um, I think, is a good thing so that hopefully um, as we move forward, I won't have, there won't be me an atologist who's reading a paper that they're severe or, or and then they get interpreted as abnormal. And then that turns into the child won't be able to do anything. And you hit on a, an important word in there too, that I think um, all parents would say they want their kids to be happy. When you said that their child is happy, I think that's a, a big thing that, you know, parents want for their children when they think of how they want their life to be. I have another question here from Fabiana too. She said, the way that healthcare providers classify it now, if we change it to reflect parents' perceptions, how would that influence how families can access services or would it influence? So there are sort of two parts to that. Um, I... I feel that, and and there things are moving in the direction that um, children and and their families should be able to access services based on what the child needs. Um, and but you make a good point, Fabiana, that in the past governments have often um, created, again, boxes. And if you don't fit into the box, you don't get the service. And often that box meant that you had to have a label, a diagnosis. Um, and so talking to parents, I've often said, well, in my report, I'm going to explain it, write it this way. Because if I use these words in the report, then it's more likely that you'll get the services that I think your child would benefit from. Um, so um, on the other hand, my experience is that if we can have an open and frank discussion, both about what a, the challenges a child has or may have, um, and the services they need, and the reality we live in in terms of how you get services, then, um, and some of the labels, and for example, cerebral palsy is one, I'd often spend a lot of time saying, you know, you may, um, many parents have heard cerebral palsy, but it's a very scary thing because they've only ever heard about the most um, people who are the most severely affected with it, but it's actually this broad thing, broad category of 
challenges. Um, and yeah, here are the stories I know about kids doing amazing things, even though they have um, cerebral palsy. So let's have those conversations so that um, there's a better understanding. And um, yes, if we have to um, use some language that's going to help them get the services because so they'll fit into the right box, then we'll, we'll do that. But if parents understand what we're doing and what we're saying and what it all means, um, then it shouldn't influence things or only in a positive way. I wanted to talk about um, the assessment of the kids themselves. So um, I was, if I can read my chicken scratch here, I was taking notes as you were presenting and you talked about significant disagreements um, with the ones that you highlighted were like the cognitive and language and motor, like those things that um, basically kids have to show us, demonstrate it in order for it to be noted. Noted. Now, is some of that, do you think, um, the environment of the follow-up program itself of, of trying to observe kids under pressure or how do you account for some of that? Well, I mean, the Bailey three, so there, there have been different versions um, of the, the Bailey and we've been using the third one, um, but it, this same way of administering um, the tasks, the, the, the things that the kids are asked to do has been done sort of in a similar um, hospital or clinic setting when it was developed. Um, so th that is factored in, um, but what we've recently started using is the fourth edition of the Bailey. And when they developed that, they said uh, that we should factor in what um, parents have observed. So let's say is, you know, will your, will the child walk up some steps? And we've all seen it. The kid comes to clinic. They had to get up early. They're grumpy. They don't want to do it. And they just sit down and they refuse to do it. Um, so and that's surprisingly common. Um, so to get a better reflection with this Bailey 4, um they'll now ask parents if they if they will do that in the home setting and um and then factor that into how they test it so that's um an improvement in the most re recent change to the bailey so how will this look moving forward will there be changes and how will we implement those changes and I'm assuming that it's not just for Canada either in terms of what was outlined uh, to define those classifications. So it sounds like there even has to be a larger discussion. I don't know if it's happening elsewhere, but what's the future of all this? Well, the nice thing about, um, about this study um, and it used to be when you got received money to do some research, once you finish the research and typically it would get um, published in a scientific journal, that was sort of the end of your research. But um, there's been a very positive change to say that, well, no, the research is supposed to lead to improvements, lead to, to change. And so one of the things we've really enjoyed doing in, in Parent Epic is um, we have our final steps are saying, how do we take all these results, not just 
publish it in um, a scientific journal, but we said, how do we share it with parents? So thank you again for letting us present it, um, these results at Preemie Chats. But we've also been working with CPBF um, and, um, and we've been creating um, blogs and um, it's in um, an example of one of the blogs we've created about the um, about our research results is is in the blogs and we um, really encourage your feedback um, through the blogs or today um, so that we can incorporate that um, so that's been one part of disseminating getting the results out to um, parents and um, hospitals and follow-up clinics but um, we're also combining all the results so that um, we will have a guideline um, which can be used in Canada but will also make um, make it available across the um, across the world so that it's not just Canadian families who can benefit from this research, but families um, around around the world. Um, so that's part of the step three, uh, which we're not finished finished yet. I like to hope we're more than halfway, but um, but but getting there and um, and talking to people all over the place. Yeah, so they what we call the knowledge dissemination and translation um, are important parts of the research. Absolutely. Now we have a comment uh, from Ashley. I don't know if it'll all, f oh, it does all show up there. So she just comments that she was born in 1983 at 24 weeks at BC Children's Hospital. And she was in a follow-up study until she was 16. And she comments that it was great because it showed areas that she struggled with at school uh, that the school wouldn't have picked up on short-term memory, processing, and comprehension issues as well as other areas. And I know from personal experience with my pre-meet, we loved the follow-up program and the ideas that it gave even of how to um, uh, challenge Tessa. I loved the the games and stuff that they gave us to, to do at home. And CPBF has been working closely with CN Fun on a number of uh, materials and initiatives. And so I wondered if you could speak a little bit to that as well. Well, one of the fun things about doing research is the people you get to work with. And um, CPBF and Fabiana and many others are part of that. And uh, what we've been working on over mostly over the summer is how can we create information about neonatal follow-up um, programs so that parents can um, know what to expect, can come prepared, be able to ask good questions and that kind of thing. And I think um, Leah will show some, but first of all, I wanna thank um, Ashley for first of all, uh, attending um this webinar and saying hello and yes you would have been our follow-up program at um bc children's and women's hospital started in 1983 so you would have been one of our um very first um children that came came through and here you are participating giving back thank you so much and then I'll let Leah show some of the, um, a few examples of what we've been working on this summer. Sure. Oh, here we go, the pathway. So I have the website there as well. So do you wanna just walk us through what, uh, how families could use this? Um, yeah, so we've created a couple of um, sort of tools or things that you can print out that can be used um, either 
The follow-up programs can use them and give them out to families, but they can also be useful for families to download um, from the CPBF um, site so that uh, you can know um, when you're going to be going to the follow-up um, program. Um, and there are differences across the country, so that's why we have to we had to leave it with some flexibility. Um, and so that you can also get um, an idea of some of the things to ex to expect. Um, and all the wonderful artwork and stuff um, really comes from the the team at CPBF. I love all the colors. Yeah. And then there's also the graduation certificate. So important for families to get something like this, just to, to recognize the achievement of going through the follow-up program. I know that we have ours in, in Tessa's baby book and she still loves to look at it. Yes, I think it's uh, important, as I mentioned before, that, you know, there's has tended to be this emphasis on the negative things and the challenges, but yeah. there are so many positive things um, that we can be proud of in children who were born um, very preterm. Um, and this is just an example of how we can celebrate um, celebrate those successes. Well, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for joining us today for this preemie chat, for sharing your important research. It really is incredible to be including the voice of, of uh, families on uh, their child's outcomes and development. And check out the CPBF website for to, to take a look at that neonatal follow-up um, portion of the website. There's a lot of resources there that you can use. Thank you for joining us. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day and the start to a new school year. And thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So Canadian Prematures Babies Foundation is proud to partner with uh, CN Fun, as you would have heard about there on this new initiative to amplify the voices of parents who have children born preterm. So I do hope you will check out the website and that new section neonatal follow up. It has some great resources there and will answer some of the questions that you might have about neonatal follow up programs, the people you might meet. Uh, the reason why it's important, all kinds of information. CPBF is a charitable organization, and it believes that through education and support, families will be empowered and ready to care for their baby. Visit their website, canadianpremies.org, and consider making a donation. Together, we can create a brighter future for all our families. I hope that you will join us next week. We will be back next Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We will have special guest physiotherapist Lori Robbins with us, who will be talking about a new initiative to reinvigorate medical rounds in NICU. It's taking a holistic approach to traditional medical rounds. And I hope to see you there. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend.